We're here at a top secret studio somewhere in Germany to show you something which many of our viewers may deem slightly controversial. And that's because we spend our lives telling you to drive smaller, cheaper, more affordable electric vehicles. And this arguably is the antithesis of that. But as we enter mainstream adoption of electric vehicles, we know that there is an appetite for cars that are just cars that people love to drive and far surpass their petrol or diesel counterparts. Maybe that's what we have here. That's the Audi Q6 e-tron, and this is the Fully Charged Show. Like Fully Charged? Then you'll love our fun-packed Everything Electric Expos around the world. Next up, we're in London and Harrogate. Remember, energy and transport professionals go free on the first day. So I know what you're thinking. Audi have been on this electrification journey for a little while now. We've seen the Q4 e-tron, the Q8 e-tron. We went and saw the Audi e-tron GT actually in the wind tunnel here in Germany. And you can watch that episode, highly recommend it. So what's so special about this? Why on earth should we be excited about the Q6? Well, it all lies in bespoke architecture. And this is the first vehicle for Audi, which sits on the PPE, the premium platform electric, which is also what underpins uh, the new Porsche Macan EV. And because it's on that bespoke architecture, that unlocks a couple of really, really cool things. And that's what I'm going to try and do my best to show you today. But let's first of all start with the design of this thing. And I want to start by talking about this grill because of course that's not a grill it's not doing anything but it does speak to that kind of original Audi design language and certainly if you were considering a new car and you were thinking hmm do we go for a Q5 or do we go for an electric Q6 actually it does give you that familiarity and you know perhaps it makes that transition to electric vehicles that tiny little bit less daunting when I look at this I'm like hmm what kind of personality does this car have from the front and I think it has a bit of a combined personality because sometimes it looks a little bit severe, but there is a component of this that is a little bit cheeky, which I have to say I really like. And part of that is achieved by these incredible headlights. And they're incredible because you can program these to do whatever you want. They could wink, they can have a particular profile, so you can adapt this depending on your mood. Say it's a very, very congested and busy traffic day, you could, you could have a slightly more severe headlight if you're feeling pretty light and lively, perhaps going on a road trip, you could have something that's a bit more cheery. Now, typically when you look at vehicles in any kind of review, you kind of see them at that sort of front three quarter view. And I deliberately didn't want to do that because we started at the front and it looks quite imposing. It looks quite traditional in terms of its SUV-ness. And then when you come to the side, Hello, teeny tiny overhangs. There is absolutely nothing there. That is such a tiny overhang. And it means that the wheels can go right to the corners, go right to the edges, which of course helps with sort of handling and steering and all that kind of thing, but means that you can get so much from the wheelbase. So in terms of overall dimensions, this vehicle is 4.77 meters in total length. To give you an idea, that's very similar to the Model Y, the EV6, the Ionic 5, the Mercedes EQC. But wheelbase, that's where things get very exciting because the wheelbase is 3.889 meters. That's, I think, 80 millimeters longer than the Q5. And that's all because everything can be pushed right to the outer edges and really maximizing the experience that you would get for the occupants inside the vehicle. In terms of the exterior shape of this, I really do believe that this has been incredibly well executed. There is something that is at the same time very taut, very sort of structural and quite dynamic, and also something very fluid about it. It sort of reminds me of a professional tennis player, very elegant and yet very strong. And I think really enabled by, again, these very structural components that you see here. Um, and of course, with the sort of tapering roof line as well. But actually the real beauty, in my opinion, is what sits within the platform. Now, for those who have been watching or following the Q6 e-tron journey for a little while, will know that this is, a little bit late and that's all been because there's been so much attention going into developing that PP platform and making it absolutely perfect and I think the proof is in the pudding there are so many stats here that really point to the fact that they're focusing on making this driving experience incredibly fun incredibly efficient so a couple of things to tell you there is an asynchronous motor at the front a permanent magnet motor at the back asynchronous means no rare earth metals really nice to kind of reduce that impact 
But also, both those motors, they take up 30% less space. They're 20% lighter. There's 20% more power density. There's so much more that you get from those, from those motors. Um, and not least also, we've got silicon carbide inverters. The steering has been made completely new. So all of that goes into making, you know, we're not just talking about batteries anymore in terms of efficiency. We're talking about that entire powertrain that it becomes more efficient and way more fun. Of course, we'll be able to confirm those things when we actually get behind the wheel and take this out on the road. We have come into the interior and I think what's really interesting is that from an exterior perspective, you know, we've said things like it's very fluid, it's very strong, it's got taut lines. And how do you create something on the interior that feels soft and homely, but also doesn't feel totally disconnected from the exterior? And I think that's what they managed to nail pretty well here. We've got really, really kind of structural lines that very much mirror what's going on outside, but at the same time, there is a softness to them. It does have that very lovely, homely feel. And even these materials feel like materials I would genuinely like a sofa made out of. It's, it's, it's nice, it's fancy. But I think the thing that is, is most notable is this digital stage, so-called, and you'll notice immediately that it's on a curve. That isn't gimmicky at all, because if you consider driving in your driving position, I've got my uh, seat where I drive, normally when you have quite a large flat screen, the most right-hand button feels very far away and you do have to do a little shift in order to reach it. But if you've got it curved, it's so much easier to reach. That feels so well thought out with regards to ergonomics. Anyone who has had a VW vehicle, an Audi vehicle, will have known the horrors that they've had of time gone past with the HMI. And we will be relieved to know that this is an Android Auto OS system. They have said, no, you take over, you know what you're doing when it comes to software, you do it. And they have, and it looks pretty good. It is pretty responsive. It certainly looks pretty neat. And if you're not a fan of that, then of course you can have Apple CarPlay or Android Auto. There's another thing that I think is worth pointing out here. One is that there is a screen for the passenger and it's designed such that really when you're the driver, you cannot see what's going on there. So they are able to have their own entertainment uh, when you're driving on a long journey. Personally, I think that's a bit antisocial. I'd be pretty, pretty peeved if my passenger was uh, watching a film whilst I was driving, but you know, each to their own. There is also this light bar, which isn't just from a design perspective, but actually it is totally interactive and helps give you information at your eye line. So for example, at the moment you can see that it's blue. If I was going to pull out to the right and there was a cyclist there, it would flash red in that corner. And it just helps you to have all of those kind of gentle visual cues in your eye line rather than sort of flashing and blaring at you in these screens here. So again, some, some just really nice, well thought out uh, design features. And the same is true that, you know, whilst that's hazard detection and all that kind of thing, it also will show you, show you um, charging status. We haven't spoken about price yet. And the price of this will start at £68,795 when it comes to the UK later this summer. That isn't insubstantial. And particularly when you consider that you can get a Model Y, an Ionic 5, an EV6 for less than that. And above it, you can get the BMW iX, the Mercedes, the Porsche Macan EV. It does sort of sit squarely between those two brackets. But if I compare this to say, the arguably slightly more utilitarian, certainly comparatively Model Y, this feels premium. It gives you that taste of premium feel. It is that car for people who like their cars. Back seat test. And I would say, I'm exceedingly impressed. I've moved the seat back to a much more exaggerated driving position because I'm five foot three. When it's in my driving position, it's just not representative of what the average person will experience. So that front seat is right the way back and we are really experiencing the benefit of that enormous and very, very long wheelbase because you can see there is no risk of me banging any knees whatsoever there. I've got so much room above me. I'm sure Jack, who's six foot five, he would be absolutely fine. In fact, he would be laughing back here. We've got a lovely armrest with two additional cup holders. We can adapt seats and heated seats there. This feels really, really nice and certainly would set you up 
very, very well for a long car journey. Coming around to the rear, we have the similar opportunity for personalization with programming these LED lights. I do think that's really cool. I'm sure many people will think that's slightly gimmicky, but I don't know, I think it's really playful in a car that ultimately looks quite serious. It has this lovely light beam. We've seen that before. I personally love it. I think it's very demure, actually. Um, but what have we got in terms of boot space? Well, a whopping 526 litres, uh, just a little over 1,529 with the seats folded down. And of course, a... Oh! Oh, there we go. I was just... <laughs> that was me. User error, not car error. There is a hidden floor. Now, one of the things that I think is quite cool about this, and of course in there you've got your charging cable, is that sometimes you see the false floor occupies the entire bit of the boot and that means that you have to take stuff out in order to be able to access it. This is sort of a split so you could push your stuff to the back and then still be able to open that. So just a nice kind of you know consideration to usability. There's 2.4 tonnes of towing capacity so if you've got one of these of course you've probably got a boat uh, so you can tow your boat. Put your golden retriever in the back. Lovely. We can all aspire to that. This sits on an 800 volt architecture and to understand why that's significant, think about your high school physics and P equals IV or power equals current times voltage. So the higher the voltage, the lower the current for the same power. And that means that you get fewer losses, you can have smaller cables, it means less copper, ultimately making this much more efficient and much lighter. So when you can charge at a DC compatible charging station, you can get up to 270 kilowatts, charging the battery from 10 to 80% in 21 minutes, or in other words, adding 260 kilometers in just 10 minutes. Now, given the fact that this is very much targeted at young families, albeit affluent young families, that is the difference on a sort of long road trip between full meltdown tantrums and a very lovely and cohesive onward journey. However, not all charging stations are compatible with 800 volt architectures. And in that instance, this basically splits into two 400 volt systems, which it can charge in parallel up to 150 kilowatts. The net effect, I should say, of an 800 volt architecture is that you can get much, much more power. And in fact, this one, this is the Quattro, that goes up to 285 kilowatts. There is the um, SQ version, which goes up to 380 kilowatts. Super, super powerful vehicles. Um, I should say, with that kind of power, we're talking 0 to 62 or 0 to 100 kilometers an hour between 4.3 and 5.9 seconds, depending on which spec that you get. Let's talk about the battery. It's big. It's Rivian R1S BMW iX kind of big. It's 100 kilowatt hours, which of course, if we're talking that big, then it's an MC, uh, nickel manganese cobalt and not LFP because it is slightly more energy dense. But I'm told that the team have managed to get it 30% more energy dense than its e-tron predecessors, which is definitely really, really cool. Now, of course, NMC, it's slightly more tricky than LFP with regards to thermal stability. So there are a ton of battery management systems and cooling systems and all of that jazz. What does that mean for range? Well, 385 miles or 620 kilometers. So definitely absolutely bonkersly big. That means this car really is for someone who is doing those very, very long miles. Perhaps someone has a very, very long commute or is frequently traveling away. There are so many more things that I could tell you about this car, but I do think it's best left for when we get to actually drive it and to put them to the test. But what's left to say? Well, I think this is a real remarkable feat of engineering, and it's not just gonna be class leading for an EV, it's going to be class leading. And in that respect, maybe this is the car that makes it very hard to hate EVs.